Enough said, right? <laughs> and the big surprise for me was that the forecast on the app and the phone said that it was there was going to be a little rain sometime around one o'clock or two o'clock. But it didn't make any announcement about this and it was teeming for the last hour and a half. The whole time, non-stop, beautiful rain. Look at the way it's flooded here. All waterlogged. Where does the word waterlogged come from? A log, a piece of a trunk of a tree, waterlogged. I wonder, does it come from loch? Loch is the uh, <clears throat> Irish word, the Gaelic word for a lake. Have to check out the synonyms there. Look at all that water. That's almost as intensive as it was on the 23rd of December, 24th of December, when we had a, that amazing downpour that caused so much damage. And I love these mountains now with the fog. It's rare we get to see fog like this on the mountains. Well, it's cloud down on the mountain, right? I wonder if that's, that's basically what fog is. We don't see too much fog around here. Whereas at home in Ireland and in Europe and the States, I remember terrible fog in Canada. I was on the road a lot, so I, I got to travel a lot. I was on different missions of preaching in different towns all over the place, mission appeals. And I remember driving from somewhere around the Niagara Falls area to Michigan, and the fog was so bad, over to Detroit, the fog was so bad <clears throat> through Ontario that um, I had to stay really tight close to a truck that was in front of me. It was going very steadily, and it had uh, um, special lights and so I could see the truck and I knew by following the truck, maintaining the, the rate of the truck, that I would be doing okay. There were two of us. Oh, there's a little bit of sun up there, <laughs> reflection. So that's coming because of the sun above the clouds. The sun is above the clouds. That's a wonderful book of uh, Dr. Inright. Uh, rising above the clouds on forgiveness how to rise above the clouds he led a marvelous encounter at notre dame in jerusalem a forgiveness conference with jewish and muslim and christian thinkers and scholars and wonderful people people of god on forgiveness above the clouds, rising above the clouds. I think it was the first international conference, interreligious conference on forgiveness. Marvelous event. So we have lots of clouds today, we can rise above them. And when we're reading poor Job today, a lot of clouds is like in a deep depression. His reading of human life is so bleak. He is so deeply tried. I wonder if it's up to the step, the big platform underneath the stairs here. No, not quite yet, but it's getting there. This is an easy place to get down to the water. In these conditions. Marvelous morning. I'm okay. The step is broken here, I didn't notice. 
It's a real old stairs. We never use this. People don't come down here. Except you guys in the morning for live stream. A nice reflection there of the railing and of the stones. Here the clouds that are above here. Oh, look at the birds in the water flying. Well, they're just reflecting from up there, you know. <laughs> first time I saw, first time I saw birds flying in the water. There's another one flying here in the water. Come on. I missed him, but he was just flying across here. Wow, that's so beautiful. Look at that circle there. But it's not a circle. It, the grass is above and then it's reflecting underneath. So everything here is a perfect reflection. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Look at that perfect reflection. Everything is symmetrically reflected. Perfect mirror. Oh, it's beginning to drip again, but I have my umbrella. So I can handle this. I hear a jackal up there in the in Mount Arbel. aren't good enough to see it. It doesn't look like it's going to rain too hard, but I have the umbrella. So we come back to Job, and so he's in a life that is a terrible burden, a drudgery, no hope, can't sleep. The day feels so long. And then he says the days go by quickly. It's like total frustration. His desires and will isn't happening. He wants relief. Why does he live? Lord, take, away, take me away from this life. No, it's so human. So human. Such a common experience. People that are deeply frustrated. Why do people turn to drugs? They must be very unhappy with their life, turning to alcohol, leading to behaviors that are then very embarrassing, very, first of all, very damaging. But embarrassing is the social aspect of it, but very destructive. Look at all the reflections there of the cloud and the lake and the mountain, the trees. And so there's a total contrast between that and the second reading and the gospel reading. Well, let's stop at the psalm. The Lord heals the brokenhearted. 
So that's the Lord's will to heal the brokenhearted. That's his want, that's his desire. That's what he wants to do for us, to heal the brokenhearted. And that's what Jesus is doing in Capernaum, right across from here. I'll just point out the spot here if I can. There we go, my finger. So it's right across there. That's a little bit enlarged. You can see the mountain of Beatitudes in the third to the left and then a little bit over. More or less in the center of the screen, a little bit right of center at the water on the other end, four miles away. And there he is, morning to night, healing people. They're bringing all their sick and broken people, and he's healing them. So that theme of Job is there, but finding its remedy. But the focus of the gospel is a little bit broader today, and there are three very big actions of Jesus. He's teaching. It's all one day because it's joined up with last Sunday's reading. And it's a, a, a Shabbat, a, a Shabbat, a Sabbath day, a Saturday. That's what the text says. And after expelling the demon, which we were dealing with last Sunday and teaching with authority, he goes to Peter's house, which is over there in Capernaum, right across from the synagogue. And there's a lot of archaeology about that. The certainty of Peter's house there is pretty sure. I was blessed about, I think it's almost two years ago now, a year and a half ago, to work with the French regisseur to produce a movie on the historicity of Jesus. And he asked me to do the part in Capernaum to comment on the archaeology and the information that's out there about Capernaum. And the movie starts off saying that Jesus didn't exist. And the first half of it is about that, like typical European intellectual French movie. And then the turn happens around the middle of the movie with some comments from some historians. And obviously the evidence piles up that of the historicity of Jesus. So I did the part on Capernaum and it was very interesting to read up on the uh, facts of the archaeology and it's Peter's house as the archaeologists don't doubt that and there's Jesus and the people are crowding around but then he goes away very early in the morning to pray in a quiet place But he continues on his mission of teaching to all the villages and towns of Galilee. So we see somebody that's totally given to three things. To prayer and to teaching and to helping the needy. You should listen to Bishop Barnes' commentary today. It's a very powerful presentation of that this summarizes what the church does institutionally all the institutions of the church if you look at the institutional presence of the church in the world it's teaching all the schools and universities teaching the faith it's praying all the churches all the places of prayer all the adoration 24-hour adoration all the the devotions retreats uh, the liturgies, 
in the churches every day, and especially on Sundays. And then we have uh, all the care for the needy, all the hospitals, orphanages, clinics, all kinds of outreach for the needy, homes for the elderly. So many, so many forms of outreach. Even in Jerusalem, when I, since I came here about 15 years ago, there was a legal office set up to help uh, people in the area who needed legal help to deal with injustices that were happening in their lives, to assist them, to help them through. So th those three dimensions carry on Jesus' life completely in the in society so that the, the identity of the church is replicating the life of Jesus. There are obviously lots of challenges in doing all of that, all of the activity, providing all those buildings, all the organization, the fundraising, all of these things to maintain these services. But basically the structure of all of this replicates Jesus' life. A life of adoration and prayer, a life of teaching, the faith, think of all the teaching of the faith that happens when parents teach their children. They're always communicating to them the great love of God, his work of salvation, the need of humanity. And this summarizes the, the, the life of the church uh, pretty well. Then there can be crisis in these institutions. Some people can lose their identity. They can uh, maybe lack, lack prayer and they get exhausted. Or maybe they're very indulging in piety and they lack looking after the poor. Or maybe they abandon the teaching of the faith and many people don't know the faith. And then we have a very big contrast to Job in the second letter, uh, the, in the second reading, the letter of Paul. And there you see Paul, who is absolutely, totally polarized, completely committed to doing everything to communicate, to teach, to bring the message of salvation to the world. He is so passionate, so polar, so completely taken, so completely committed and he doesn't want anything for it and he adapts to everybody so they can understand it the way they are in the best possible way. And the strenuous effort he made despite so many persecutions and difficulties that he had in his life, uh, it's absolutely amazing to see the intensity of commitment. And he feels from the depths of his heart an incredible uh, drive that compels him. In another text he says, the charity of Christ urges me. Caritas Christi urget me. So he is compelled, driven, uh, motivated. So that's the total polar opposite to Job. In Job's reading today, that's his first reply after all these guys are um, you know, the three guys who come to kind of teach him that he's in the wrong and that his sufferings, uh, God is just and, and all of that. So Job is in the, in the middle of his first response. It's worth reading it all. We have a snippet of it in the liturgy. But it's a, an amazing text of Job's uh, deep frustration, deep sadness, deep... Uh, yeah, frustration is probably the better word. I'd like some more words to say it. <laughs> and Paul is the exact opposite. He is like bursting, bursting with energy, with desire, with programs, with pushing, with adapting, with uh, being out there, engaging people. Uh, every talent he has, every fiber in his body and his 
mind and his soul is, is into that. So people, I wish you a life of meaningful fulfillment, spreading the good news by your example, by your life, serving the needy in your own home. Somebody's hungry, making a nice meal, a cup of tea, saying hello, giving people a smile. Everybody's needy for a smile and everybody loves a smile unless they're in a very, very sulky mood altogether. And there they need a little bit of patience and compassion. So that's our life, people. A life, a wonderful life, a redeemed life, a life of grace despite the troubles and difficulties we might have along the way. God bless you on this rainy day at the Sea of Galilee. And I think next week we we'll promise that we'll have, we'll have the sun rising in the morning, God willing. See you later, alligators. Let's try again. <laughs>